name is Cristina Arias and I'm here at Crane Center, San Francisco. I'm very honored to have uh, Dr. Min Jin. And this is the second chapter of um, robotic peritoneal vaginoplasty. And well, again, doctor, this is the second part of our interview, our conversation. And one of the things that we were talking behind the behind the camera, it was your passion about um, the, the the LGBT community, but especially like how you change lives and how um, growing up around trans people like change your life and inspire you to perform the profession that you that, that you perform now. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, I mean, the way that I grew up was that it really doesn't matter who you are, uh, what you claim, uh, your orientation, none of that matters to me. Uh, you know, a person is a person is a person. Uh, you know, whether you're in the community or out, I mean, honestly, I don't care <laughs> if, if, if that makes any sense. Uh, it's just everything, all of that is just normal to me, you know? And so it's not like I'm trying to seek out the LGBTQ community or some other community. Um, it's just everyone has their, you know, their, their medical needs. And I'm just a doctor who's looking to meet those needs. Uh, and the way that I see it, the LGBTQ community has been disproportionately left out in the cold, so to speak. Uh, and so there are a lot of people that need help and I just want to help, you know? So, yeah, uh, I don't know if that adequately answers the question. Uh, yeah, it, it, I don't see it as a special community. You're just a person. You need help. I want to help you. And that, and I think that's one of the things that make you very special uh, for the community because you are changing lives and you do this. You just see the community and the trans people as humans, as any anybody else in society. And well, we're gonna start with a few spicy questions. <laughs> you know, uh, we already covered uh, like a big part in our first segment. But now we are going to cover uh, a few more questions. And the first one is, um, when uh, when can I, like, let's say that I had the robotic uh, peritoneal ba flap vaginoplasty, mm -hmm. how long do I have to wait to have penetration? Sure. Penetration for fun uh, should wait until three months. Uh, you know, I'm often actually asked, can I have it sooner? And the answer is no. And then the other side of that question is, how will I know at three months if I'm actually ready to have sex? Uh, and the answer to that is, well, you're going to be dilating. Uh, and so you will know before anyone, including myself, whether or not you're ready to have sex because you're placing a dilator in the part of the region or dilation, you want to know, am I healed enough to actually uh, enjoy penetrative intercourse? Uh, and so it, it's always fun when, when we discover that point in time. What about oral sex? Like, let's say that now I have a um, peritoneal flap vagina mm -hmm. and I want to receive oral sex. How long do I have to wait? Because I know that Probably, well, there's scars or there's some incisions that are healing. How long can I wait? Sure. Uh, usually around six weeks. Uh, honestly, as a surgeon, I prefer that we wait longer to have that. Uh, that said, uh, again, you know your body best. And I can tell you as a surgeon uh, who knows the dynamics of healing, Everything is pretty much strong enough to uh, withstand oral you know, sex at that point. Um, so while I can't fully endorse it, I've, I've actually had enough patients who have done that uh, to know that it actually is okay to go for it when 
can't do that. Uh, I, I, I will say at this point, I tell all of my patients the same thing when it comes to sexual activity. In the beginning, you don't want to go all out. So you know, make love, not sex at the very beginning. You work your way up to sex. So you want to be gentle to begin with, though. Okay, so another spicy question. What about anal sex? Sure. Um, at least three months. Uh, you know, in the first episode, we talked about rectal injury, the possibility of fistula. Uh, again, by six weeks, most of the healing is done, and so you should be uh, good to go by the three month mark to have anal sex. Uh, that said, uh, it's a bit of an unknown situation here. And, you know, just surgically, you have a tendency to be kind of conservative because you don't want anything bad to happen to your patient. Uh, and so, um, all I can say is you're going to have to wait three months. Please use lots of lube and it needs to be gentle. And if your body is telling you no, you need to stop. That's how that goes. Okay, so. Quick answer, if you just, uh, if you recently had vaginoplasty, no sex, no, no, no vaginal sex, no anal sex, at least three months. three months. If you can longer, longer, so your body can heal properly and well, we don't want complications and well, that's it. Um, another question is in regards of the sex drive. Like this is a question that uh, many, well, not many, but probably my closest friends that are watching this video, very possible. They're like, what happens to the sex drive like after this surgery? Because you remove the testicles, right? Mm -hmm. So what's going on now that I have a vagina? What's going on with the, um, with the sex drive? Like, let's say that I was on hormones uh, and T blockers for 10 years mm -hmm. and now I had a um, peritoneal vaginoplasty. What's going on with the, with the sex, sex, sure. sex drive? That's a fantastic question. I don't know if I have the right answer for you. I think that's something that does need to be studied more through research. There's actually a fantastic initiative going on um, where the questions that we want answered uh, through research uh, through patient reported outcomes research is actually driven by the patients, not the surgeon. Basically, all right, patients, what are the questions that you want answered most? Please vote. And then we take that and we run with it in academ academia. So actually the fellow uh, at NYU before me, Giolani D, uh, has been playing a huge hand. She's doing amazing work. She's over at the Oregon Health and Sciences University. Uh, and so I think we'll, we'll find a lot of that information out uh, in due time. That said, I'll try to answer the question as best I can. So I haven't noticed any difference, meaning patients haven't reported a huge difference in, um, in sexual drug and libido. Um, but what has changed, right? The, the testicles are gone, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, now, most of your testosterone is not there. Your adrenal glands produce a little bit, but not that much. Um, but you're also off of your T blockers, mm -hmm. right? And T blockers are notorious for filling your, your libido. And so now we've got this situation, you know, where one comes down, the other goes up. So where, where do things settle out? That's, that's a big question. We don't know. Well, Probably this will be a good question for the girls who already um, have had the surgery and I'm sure that every case is different. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I have two more questions and I, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to forget it, but one of the question is, one of the questions is, um, what type of medication do I have to keep on or what type of medication do I have to, do you prescribe or after the surgery, do I still have to take hormones? Do you recommend uh, take testosterone? Because I've talked to uh, different girls who already had the surgery and they're like, 
oh, now my doctor is giving me, I don't know, a little bit of testosterone and I still take estradiol and, you know, every case is different and mm -hmm. depending on, on, on the surgeon. But what do you recommend to your patients after they have had peritoneal vaginoplasty? The best advice I can give is to continue to see your hormone providers. Uh, there will be a need for changing around uh, you know, your hormones. Uh, and it should not be from me, the surgeon. Uh, my expertise is doing surgery. I think the nuances of treating one's hormone levels is complicated enough that it should be dedicated to another branch of medicine, the endocrinologist. Um, and so I, I, I won't pretend to know exactly uh, how to change medications after surgery as far as hormones are concerned. Um, but you definitely should you know, seek out the care of, a, of an expert in that field. Perfect. And well, this is another question, is another spicy question that everybody, everybody wants to know. And you know, this is also like, I don't know, I don't want to say if a mystery of a myth, but we all know that this, uh, well, sex reassignment surgery back in, I don't know, 70s, 80s, it was a surgery where probably not many of the, the, the trans women who had this surgery were able to experience pleasure or, or a sensation because it was a different technique. It was, well, different, um, it, it was a different years, right? And what about now? What's going on with peri robotic peritoneal flap vaginoplasty? Um, what do you do with all these, um, with all these terminations, like nervous terminations and all like, all the sensitive parts that you remove of, oh, from the penis. Right. Um, you know, as a reconstructive surgeon, you just need to know the anatomy, especially the anatomy that you can't see, uh, like like nerve endings. Um, you know, where is it okay to cut uh, and be confident that you know you're not causing any kind of permanent um, sensory damage? Uh, and so, for example. This is more of a urologic thing rather than a, uh, you know, a robotic or a surgery thing. But uh, the neurovascular bundle that gives sensation to the penis, and I'm specifically talking about the glands that will become your clitoris, um, all of them run along the backside of, of the penis. And so you need to take great care to not damage those areas. Uh, and so, again, just knowing the anatomy and knowing where to cut and where not to cut uh, will, will lead to uh, better outcomes as far as erosion and sensation after surgery goes. I can tell you that, you know, with the technique that I was taught and that, that I do, uh, if you are able to orgasm before surgery, uh, you almost, almost 100% of the time, I put it somewhere in the 90s, uh, will be able to orgasm afterwards. Um, I don't think that was the case a long, long ago, but that certainly is and should be the case now. So many girls that probably don't have enough information, they're afraid of the surgery. Probably they wish to have this surgery, but they're like, mm, no, I don't want to lose the pleasure. I don't want to lose the sensation. And well, we all have to know that there are new alternatives, there are new techniques and wonderful surgeons now serving the community and well changing lives and, and it's amazing absolutely um it kind of goes to what we were talking about um before you know there's a lot of improvement that has been made in gender surgery and i sure hope there's a lot of improvement to be made in the future uh to provide um, better answers for for all of the trans patients out there. This question, I know that this is not your specialty. Probably we will have to contact, like, I don't know, the Crane Center San Francisco. Mm -hmm. But uh, what about the insurance and um, how, much it, how much it costs the surgery? Yeah, that's a really important question. 
that everyone should be interested in, right? Because uh, these are the practical matters of it all. Um, insurance, for the most part, is excellent at covering uh, these things uh, that are seen as uh, necessary surgery you know, rather than elective surgery. Uh, thankfully, we've come a long way in that department. We still have some improvement to make there, but uh, overall, I think we've been doing We've made great strides since the Obama, uh, Obama administration. Um, that said, you know, there are the patients who want to pay out of pocket. Um, we have an authorizations department that will uh, consult with you and talk you through all of your options. And we actually just made a brand new position called the patient advocate. Uh, or is it the patient advisor? Uh, anyhow, it's someone who will walk you through the entire financial process because let's face it, the US, US health, healthcare system can be very confusing. Um, and in, in fact, the person that we hired is uh, a trans patient who themselves have gone through surgery and had to navigate that entire space. Uh, so it's someone that knows from experience and they will help you through every step of the way uh, and until and through surgery as well. And somebody who already has experience, um, I'm sure you will be the best person to provide this, mm -hmm. this information. Um, can you provide uh, the website and probably the email or phone number of uh, Crane Center? Sure. It's cranects.com, that's it. Uh, when you go there, you'll see our, our phone number. We have two offices, one in office, Okay, we repeat crane cts.com. Okay. And well, you can you can contact Dr. Minjin and you can um, you will be able to know like all the different alternatives that Crane Center is offering to the community. Um, and um, I think that will be everything for for today. Um, I don't know if you have something that you want to share, doctor, anything else? Um, well, it's been a real honor to have been here uh, to be interviewed uh, and to reach you know, our, our audience. Um, you know, we're all in this together. We're here, we want to help. I think what you're getting by coming to Crane Center is a group of experts who care, you know? Uh, there's obviously the surgeon, but there's actually much more to the Crane Center than just me. You know, we have our expert receptionist, Toto, who keeps the ship running straight, sailing straight. Uh, we have Alex, our PA, who is an expert at all of uh, the medical matters surrounding surgery. We have Jackie, who is our uh, sort of scheduler. Uh, you'd be surprised how complex that can be. Uh, and we have uh, Valentina, of course, who is our expert medical assistant, who is so good with patients that we were basically had no choice but to promote her to patient care coordinator to help patients through the entire process. Uh, and you know, what you're getting is a bunch of expert advisors. And I can guarantee you, but by the time that you're through surgery, you'll be an expert patient. You'll know exactly what to do, how to do it. Um, and so, yeah, if you want to join the family, we're here to help, uh, just give us a call. It's amazing, Doctor. Thanks uh, for everything. Uh, thanks to Crane Center San Francisco. You have an amazing crew. Uh, it was a pleasure. They treating they treating us really well. Um, Cora, Valentina, Jackie, and well, the rest of the crew. They are they are all amazing. Thank you for everything. And well. If you have any questions, we will leave uh, the contact information on the subtitles or on the titles. And that's it. My name is Christina Arias and thanks for watching.